Okay, look at all the faces of Gordon Craig. Um, you will, there's a terrific, I think it's a terrific lineup that Andy has arranged for today. And you need it because there is so much to know about Gordon Craig. He was so big, he was so complicated. There were so many aspects to his life and his achievements uh, that certainly all I can do is to uh, give you a little bit of a taster. Um, and I suppose because I am a theatre designer or scenographer, um, that's where my focus is. I'm looking at that, or, or I shall be looking at that particular aspect of his life. For most of his life, Gordon Craig was ridiculed, uh, vilified and despised by the theatrical establishment. He was considered to be an impractical dreamer who designed settings that couldn't fit on any stage, and this infuriated the theatrical uh, profession. And a visionary, he was a visionary who wanted to get rid of actors. He would much prefer to have some kind of, he called them, it, 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 this, is, this is called shooting yourself in the foot. He came up with the phrase uber marionette, a super marionette, as the idea of the ideal performer. Uh, therefore, he wanted to get rid of actors. You can't have theatre without actors. This man is utterly stupid, etc., etc. However, in the 50 years or so since about 90, since he died in 1966, I think we've slowly come to take for granted that our understandings of theatre and performance really do have their origins in the very many practices and numerous uh, visionary propositions made by Craig concerning the art of the theatre. For example, we take it for granted today that theatre is unquestionably an art form, deserving of the highest cultural respect and the most rigorous standards of training. We take it for granted that to work in the theatre, you must study, as Rachel has already indicated, holistically, not just how to act, to dance, uh, or to direct or to design, but to learn about its history, its literature, and all the crafts so that as an art, theatre may exist in its own right, not simply as the interpreter of the ideas of a playwright. We take it for granted, we take for granted a theatre where all the elements of the stage combine to become partners in the creation of live performance. We take it for granted that the true making of theatre is the result of an act of imaginative collaboration between artists and their audience. We take it for granted that, like all forms of art, theatre serves to locate us within the community and within the world, and that we understand something of our experience of the world through our spectatorship and participation in theatre and performance. Of course, Gordon Craig wasn't the only revolutionary innovator, but he was certainly the first to articulate the complexity and far-reaching importance of theatre within societies and their cultures. For example, he was one of the first to examine the historic role and significance of theatre within the societies as diverse as the tragic forms of ancient Greece or the comic forms of the popular commedia of the Italian Renaissance. But importantly, he utterly rejected the restoration of the past and any attempt to reconstruct performance practices of the past. We can learn from their approach and from their energy. He looked back to ancient Greece. He looked back to the Commedia of Italy and saw their incredible social energy, their commitment to their societies and said, let's have that energy, but don't try and copy them. He hated for a uh, for example, the idea of reconstructing Shakespeare's globe. We've got it now. But, but in the 1920s, there were, there were many, many attempts. And he hated the idea. We can, we, we, can, we can reconstruct it, but you can't reconstruct the audience. You can't reconstruct the mindset 
of what it was like to come across the river to a performance of Shakespeare. We can't reconstruct that. That's nonsense. But we, let's try and reconstruct their energy. Let's try and reconstruct their approach. We can't imitate or impersonate either the past or indeed real life. There was far too much of that sort of thing going on in the theatre of his uh, youth. Yet the aim of the theatre as a whole is to restore its art, and it should commence by banishing from the theatre this idea of impersonation, this idea of reproducing nature. For while impersonation is in the theatre, the theatre can never be dead. And then one of his great, the agenda, I've, I've always thought of this as an agenda for the last hundred years, beginning with Craig, today, i.e., very early in the 20th century, we impersonate and interpret. Tomorrow, they must represent and interpret. But the third day, they must create. By this means, style may return. This was a vision of Craig's that produced this kind of um, artistic agenda. But the theater of Craig's youth in which he practiced during the 1890s, he spent almost 10 years as an actor in Henry Irving's company at the Lyceum Theatre, was approaching the climactic achievement of the romantic ambition to use the theatre to realise on its stage some kind of true-to-life representation of the real world. And this was an international aim, and it effectively globalised the Western theatre tradition. This is the sort of thing... If you're doing Henry V, then you, you research it, you make the stage look like, we would now say, a film or a television screen, as though we're looking into somebody else's, uh, looking into somebody else's world. If I'm doing The Merchant of Venice, then you send your designers to Venice, you get them to copy and to imitate, and then you come back and you try to actually put Venice on stage as realistically as possible. One of the designers of this there were several designers employed on this production. There was a man called Frederick Lloyds, and after he retired, he published a book called Scene Painting about how to do it. And he shows you how this kind of thing was created. This is the front view of a kind of a rural scene, and then this is the back view without the back cloth, showing all the different layers of painted scenery. And, of course, the building was built to accommodate exactly that kind of... Um, thing over on the uh, left hand side you can see the ground plan everything is arranged in straight lines across the stage the front of the stage is down the bottom the audience are looking in that way and if you look at the side the side view you can just see the stage there this tiny area and this entire apparatus for suspending and moving these two-dimensional there were theaters all over the world like this. If you produced an opera in Paris, you could take it to London or Berlin or Rio de Janeiro or Johannesburg. There was a, a theatre built along these lines and you could simply slot your pieces of scenery into it. The side view, um, there were so many uh, um, areas, there was barely any stage floor left. And of course it produced this kind of feeling in the theatre, which Craig hated, the idea of an audience sitting in the dark, very respectably, in straight rows, looking at this brightly lit space as though the stage had become a proto-television, a, a window on the world. It, in the early 20th century, to Chi, it became something of a nonsense. This, the, the great exponent of the nonsense and a great... Bet Noir of Gordon Craig was the director Herbert Beerbohm Tree. This is Midsummer Night's Dream that was performed January 1900. George Bernard Shaw reviewed it. And allegedly there were real rabbits on stage in this production. Everything was absolutely real. Uh, and George Bernard Shaw um, memorably said of it, you can't see the Shakespeare wood for the Beerbohm trees. Which I thought was I always show that slide because it gets a little titter in the audience. Um, but Irving, where, where, where Craig was working in the 90s, was exactly the same. This is uh, the mad scene, the Ophelia's so-called mad scene in Hamlet. Uh, 
um, set up as a garden of the castle of Elsinore. And of course, you spent so much time and effort on it that you had to reduce, you cut the plays of Shakespeare. This, this, is, uh, this is the wedding scene in Much Ado About Nothing, which is a tiny little scene. Nowadays, if you're doing this production, you have a dark stage, you might have a little bit of um, uh, church-like music in the background, you might have a projection of colored lights from a stained glass window, um, and that's it. You don't, you, don't need, uh, you don't need anything more. But if you're locked into that ambition of the stage representing the real world, then you can't get out of it. You have to use, and as lighting, uh, electricity was introduced um, in the late 1880s and 1890s, then, of course, you had to build more things. The two-dimensional system began to break down because if you put bright lights on it, you simply exposed that it was all two-dimensional painted stuff. And you can see something of the effect, this last image of what Craig was revolting against, if you like, in this production of 1913, where you've got a painted, you've got painted trees, you've got painted houses uh, over on the left, but look at the real shadow underneath the portico. The real shadow is black, whereas all the painted shadows are pale gray. And then, of course, you begin to put real things in it, like the motor cars, and it simply makes the scenery look uh, pretty tacky. Gordon Craig came along and very helpfully called this my first style, and he says it is, uh, an idea for Romeo and Juliet, the friar's cell, uh, Lyceum influence, the influence he means is the angle spotlights. One of Irving's favorite devices was to have limelights on the flies running down the sides of the stage, shining diagonally down, which is what Craig uh, refers to there. But a totally black stage, and all you've got is pretty much what we might instinctively go for today. You've got a prie dieu because we need to see the friar praying. So over on the right hand, over on the left hand side, you've got a little prie dieu for the, uh, uh, the the priest. You've got a doorway in for the actors to come into this dark space. You've got light shining through a window, and dimly in the background, you've got a space for the friar to emerge from somewhere deep within uh, the church. Very logical very sensible, pretty much what your GCSE student, your A-level theatre studies student might come up with today as a kind of taking it for granted. This is what designing a scenery uh, is all about. He did a whole series of early uh, productions um, in the Hampstead Conservatoire, the Coronet Theatre, various uh, institutes in and around London. The Hampstead Conservatoire is now the Embassy Theatre of the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. It still uh, survives there. Experimental productions, funded, sponsored by his mother, and most of them produ probably produced by his sister Edie. But misogynist Craig would never acknowledge that. Luckily, later on this afternoon, we have the world authority on uh, Edie Craig in Professor Cockin, and we may hear a little bit more about that. I, I suspect that these were very much collaborative productions between brother and uh, sister. Just a few quick images. This is his Bethlehem of 1902, total blackness. Um, again, a very logical thing. The night before the birth of Christ, there were shepherds in the fields tending their flocks. We've got a blackness, we've got a few wattle fence, bit of fencing, and you can't quite make them out here, but it was filled, they were filled with sheep. But very much what we might think about doing today, you get a sack, you fill it with straw, you tie the two corners together so that they begin, and you pile them up in the fold. And, lo and, be, and you light it dimly and atmospherically, and lo and behold, you've got shepherds abiding in the fields with their flocks uh, by night. We've got a ground plan of that, uh, which if you look on that side, you can see that he had this idea of a kind of a, a cinema scope stage, this long, thin stage. And on the left-hand side, there's the long, thin stage. But 
a ground plan of the audience of, of people walking by the, here's the audience, here's the stage, there's that entrance, people walking down through the audience to get into this uh, stage space. Again, something we might take for granted, how you might use the audience and having actors coming through uh, the audience. Um, Aces and Galatea, uh, with the use of gauzes, people being seen behind gauzes, the chorus being seen uh, behind a gauze. One of the difficult things, how do you perform Purcell or Handel, where you've got two people singing in deep intimacy, but then you need a chorus. You need 30 or 40 people to join in the chorus. How do you, how do you stage that without breaking the intimacy of that moment. You put them behind a gauze, you fade them away. So we hear the voices and we dimly see them. Again, something which we think is a very contemporary idea, uh, a very sensible uh, idea. Another production that his mother sponsored, Ibsen's play, The Vikings of Helgeland, uh, that he staged in 1903. Again, something if we went to Covent Garden or if we went to any theatre, the National Theatre, for example, and you saw a production like that, where the only really physical thing are these circular, this circular benches uh, with characters sitting round, a suspension overhead, and then lighting, uh, so, some form of masking around, which can modify itself with um, stage lighting. He did a series of later productions, most of them on the continent. He he went to the continent round about 1907, 1908, and effectively he was a European exile for the rest of his life. He obviously visited uh, England uh, every now and again, but uh, he was appreciated on the continent, he was respected, he was gloried uh, on the continent, um, and he had many, he, he trampled, uh, he travelled. He travelled around. He travelled around and lived in a whole variety of, 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 of places. I was going to be rather, um, probably unfair to Craig, but he had he had women in almost every town, and there was a report that his son said that he he went around Europe bestowing children upon women like papal bulls. Um, Anyway, he, 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 he had this uh, much stronger reputation on the continent of Europe, and to a certain extent he still has. He's taught regularly and as, as an absolute fixture within university degrees and training. People in Poland, people in, in, che in the Czech Republic, etc., all over Europe, they know about Craig as an important character in the development of theatre uh, throughout, throughout Europe. Uh, some images for, from Venice Preserved. Again, relying, if you look at the, uh, the first one, on this dark, rather nebulous space, which will have its atmosphere created by lighting and the placement of the actors within it. This one may mean a little more Rosmer's home, since we tend to know Rosmer, the play Rosmer's, Rosmer's home much more than we know Otway's Venice Preserved. Rosmer's home about a, a, a marriage, husband and a wife, a wife being kept within um, a middle-class house, very much captured by society, not, not, a, not a particularly un, um, unpleasant husband or a cruel husband, just by her society. And she, she spends a lot of time in this play sitting at a window looking out at the mill race, looking at the water gushing through this stream to the, to the mill race and wishes that she could be as free as that water. So what does Craig do? He comes up with two images. He comes up with the image of a stove with a stove, a, a typical northern European stove pumping out heat, creating this sense of a, of a suffocating, bourgeois internal environment and at the back of it there's this huge window looking out onto a world which she cannot occupy. So instead of creating as the theatre would have done at the time a realistic representation of a bourgeois um, sitting room, 
etc. He simply says, this is, a, this is theater, this is art. This is not imitating real life. This is trying to tell a particular story about a woman locked in a hot, stifling environment with a vision of a world that is not hers, that society denies her. In 1910, he had the preposterous idea of getting a patent. And it's called a patent for improvements in stage machinery. He designed scenes and he took out a patent and it was granted and it was technically, it was legally enf enforceable. And he had to produce the documentation to show what it looked like. This image here gives you a, a clearish idea of a stage with a series of screens, flat surfaces. There's a ground plan showing the arrangement of those. This actually shows that they're on wheels and that they can move, uh, they can move around. And that by moving these screens, we can pretty much change the appearance of the stage. Now, in 1997 uh, or 8, we did a, a computer reconstruction at the University of Kent. And this is a computer reconstruction of one of, of, that, of that patent, taking measurements solely from that patent document. And in fact, you create a stage which actually looks very modern. It looks quite, if we went into the Gordon Craig and we saw that, we wouldn't think, my goodness, what an old fashioned stage. Uh, this would look uh, very modern. Uh, this is lit in this way because Craig um, said, and I think it's a beautiful metaphor, he said, lighting is to this scene like the bow on the violin. The violin is the setting, but the violin makes no sound until you strike it with the bow. So when you light it, this idea that the light glances across the screen and screens and brings them to life. There's a picture of Craig sitting in front of a model. He opened the theater school in 1912. Uh, in, in, in Florence, and they're, they're sitting in front of his screens. They were actually built, they were never used in England. He built these in, 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 in London, and that's an image of Ellen Terry, um, his mother, who clearly was his, his, his bankroll, uh, standing on the stage, giving this sense of human perspective, giving this uh, sense of scale. I'm really sorry, I'm, I'm terribly aware of your... <laughs> inability to see what I'm showing. It's all right, it's all right. I've not, I've not, not ruined the tech, I don't think. Sorry, I just became aware that you, you couldn't, uh, couldn't see. So you get some idea. They were, they were just flat surfaces of, of uh, three by one timber covered with oatmeal colored tweed, sort of porridge colored uh, fabric, neutral, self-colored, you know, they weren't painted, they weren't intended to be painted, they were just services to receive light. Um, he describes them, they stand on the stage just as they are, they do not imitate nature, nor are they painted with realistic or decorative designs. They are monotone, a nice place, said a dear old friend, I think that was W.B. Yeats, more about him later. Uh, said a dear old friend to me on looking at the model of the scene, and I've always thought this was the best word to use, far better than scene. It is a place if it seem real. It is a scene if it seem false. If it seem false. Uh, a few designs featuring the screens. He, um, Hamlet was one of his favourite plays. He said once, um, you know, once you read Hamlet, once you perform Hamlet, you will never be the same person again. It takes over your, takes over your soul, etc. He did innumerable designs of uh, Hamlet. Possibly for Hamlet, another design, using screens, showing the figures in relationship to the screens. This is a design for Hamlet. He did a very, very distinguished production of Hamlet with Stanislavski, the great teacher, the great director and teacher of acting. Uh, at the Moscow Art Theatre, he did a production, and this shows a design for that production. We have a photograph of the model for the final scene. 
and this is what Stanislavski said about them. They hinted, i.e. the screens, at architectural forms, corners, niches, streets, alleys, halls, towers, and so on. These hints were aided by the imagination of the spectator, who in this manner became one of the active creators of the production. The public was to come to the theatre and, no, and see no stage whatsoever. The screens were to serve as the architectural continuation of the auditorium and were to harmonise with it. This idea of the collaboration that I talked about right at the beginning, this idea that the audience make the activity of theatre as much as what happens, what is presented uh, to them. This is a photograph um, of uh, the final scene at the Moscow Art Theatre. Stanislavski said the production of Hamlet was a great success. Some people were enthusiastic, others criticised, but everybody was excited and debated, read reports, wrote articles, whilst other theatres in the country quietly appropriated the ideas of Craig, publishing them as their own. Apparently, we could not expect a greater success. In the same year, uh, Gordon Craig did, a, did, a, did some designs and produced a, a model of the screens for W.B. Yeats, who was the founder and artistic director of uh, the Abbey Theatre. And Yeats bought the screens, this model, and they were built. When I, f after university, I went to the Old Vic School in Bristol and trained as a designer. And my, one of my first jobs was at the Abbey Theatre then as an assistant designer and painter. And there was an old technician there. He was about 85, I think. And he was really kept on by the theatre out of the goodness of their heart because he'd worked there for 40, 50 years and he just wouldn't retire. And he, he had a little room at the back of the stage and he, he made props or he made... He repaired um, lanterns, or he 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 he, he pottered around uh, backstage. But he he remembered the screens during the 1920s and 30s, and they were used for every production that um, that Yeats uh, put on there. And he said they were absolutely wonderful. And he and he described in such vivid detail a nighttime scene where there was a moonlight projected, a, a sort of a, a moonlight projected onto these screens. He said it was utterly, utterly magical. And they were used until a fire at the Abbey in, in the mid-1930s, and then they, 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 they kind of disappeared. This is a series of designs that he did in 19, 1907, but then he published in 1923. I'm focusing on this period partly because Craig tells me to. In his autobiography, which sadly doesn't go much further than 1910, uh, called The Index to the Story of My Days, which he published in 1958, you know, very, very late on. He says, 1907, everything was working. I'd written the act from the Uber Marionette. The screens were there. I was planning to work with Stanislavski. I'd done these productions in London. In other words, he seemed, he felt, it seemed to be a tremendous success. And that seems to have been, and I think it was, the height of his career, if you like, or the height of his achievement, from about 1900 to 1914. Um, these are designs he did in 1907, but he published in 1923. Uh, uh, um, these are the ones which were vilified because you couldn't fit them on any stage. There was no stage high enough. Uh, of course, he got an answer to that. He said, of course, these are not actually designs for scenes, these are what I would like the audience to feel when they look at the scenes on stage. In other words, then you can't take one of these and go and copy it and build it exactly as it is on the stage. This is an impression of what I would like. Very few of them have got any indication we can, we can associate them with Hamlet or with Greek tragedies or with serious tragic dramas. I mean, that, for instance, there's a tiny figure there. You could never fit that on any stage that we know. But with the skill of a lighting designer, such as Andy or Scott Palmer over there, we could create this kind of atmosphere within 
a typical letterbox stage or the stage of the Gordon Craig if we, if we, if we wanted. He was a great believer in these angled lights. Um, in this book, published in 1923, in the preface to it, the sort of acknowledgements, he said, first of all, I owe a debt of thanks to the limelight men of the Lyceum. And then he goes on, and after them, to Rembrandt and Cezanne. He, he just names all the gr artistic greats. But he starts off, and it really is interesting. All these designs have got this very strong angle light, as though it was coming from uh, the fly floors. And to suggest that the roof of a, of a scene might become part of the scenography, part of the design, was again quite uh, revolutionary and unthought of. Uh, at, um, uh, at the time. I wish to remove the pictorial scene, but to leave in its space the architectonic scene. I think those images give an indication. They're, they're not pictorial, but they're architecture that he's talking about. In 1910, as he was going from Paris to uh, Florence, where he had his theatre school, he stopped off at St. St. Nicolai de Giornico in Ticino. Now, this is a tiny, tiny church high up in the Swiss uh, Alps. And at the right, and you can, get the, you can get some indication that this was a very tiny church. This was a very small church. But he thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could take over this entire church and do something like Bach, St. Matthew, Passion, something, something like that? Um, my good friend Harvey, who I made contact again with today for the first time in 15, almost 16 years, um, said that about this time, Craig really hated the word theatre. He said, I use it because everybody knows what it means. But it's something different. It's closer to the feeling you get when you're listening to Bach St. Matthew Passion. That is the emotion of theatre. The word theatre you know, gives, gives, you, you think of drawing room comedies, but there isn't another word, so I will continue to use it. He made a model, and there's a photograph of me standing by it in 1997, just to give you an idea of how big the model was. It was eight foot three. Uh, I curated an exhibition at the V&A in 1998 on Gordon Craig, and we got it out of the storeroom, and we put it, we put it together, and this is, this is the model based upon that interior of San Nicolao de Giornico uh, in Ticino. And we got it ready for the uh, exhibition and it was on show at the V&A Theatre Museum. Uh, I don't know if you remember the old Theatre Museum, it was in Covent Garden, it had, a low, it had a ceiling which was eight feet high all over. This model was eight foot four inches. We had to take out the ceiling panels and the top of it disappeared up into uh, the roof. It would only just fit in, but you can see what an... The trouble is, it looks ginormous, it looks as though it's massive, it looks as though it's St. Paul's Cathedral, or it looks as though it's the Pantheon in Paris, it looks, it looks massive and grandiose to suggest that you could take over a place and use it just for a performance of uh, St. Matthew Passion. We did a computer reconstruction of that just to see what it would look like with different lighting uh, effects. Uh, with a night scene, what, what, how might the Garden of Gethsemane, that beautiful moment in, in the Garden of Gethsemane in the Bar St. Matthew Passion, how might that be realised, uh, etc. Or the blaze of light, uh, the, you know, the, 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 day, the, the three days after the crucifixion when Christ uh, meets his, uh, Mary in, in, in the garden, etc., etc. He did some designs for theatre. This is... Uh, quite late. It's based upon his Arena Goldoni. The Arena Goldoni was a strange theatre. He got an open-air auditorium, uh, a semicircular, small, rather like a Roman amphitheatre, but then at, at, at the end of it was a proscenium arch stage with a roof and all the rest of it. So it was like a, a proscenium arch stage, but instead of an auditor indoor auditorium, there was an outdoor auditorium. Based upon that, he conceived of this uh, 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 this uh, possibility. But he kept going back to the, the, the feeling of the theatres of antiquity when he talks about the theatre of Rome being uh, 
The whole of the theatre was of stone. The whole theatre was the scene. One part of it held the spectators, the other act of it. The, the other, the actors. But all of it was the scene. The place for the drama. Um, of course, that wasn't uh, achieved uh, in his uh, lifetime. But during the century, there have been many attempts to try and achieve this synthesis. Obviously, we are particularly keen on it in the UK because we had a, uh, an important example in Shakespeare's Globe where the idea of the architecture of the theatre was also uh, the scenery. Uh, Terence Gray at the Cambridge Festival Theatre is probably the closest to actually trying to put some of Craig's visions uh, on stage and build that architectonic scene. But of course, Meyerholt in Soviet Russia, Tyron Guthrie at uh, Stratford, Ontario and in Minneapolis, and then with Colin George and Tanya Masevich, the Crucible Theatre in, in Sheffield, and more recently, Peter Brook in Paris uh, throughout uh, Europe and Africa. In the most exciting modern theatre, we can find traces of Craig's visions especially that of the integration of all the elements. But I don't think I've really answered the question, who is Gordon Craig, and it will need all the speakers together. You might collectively get some, uh, 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 some idea. Fifteen years ago, I came up with an idea. I introduced my mother's button box as a caution to the scholar and the person who makes histories. And it seems particularly appropriate in terms of Gordon Craig. The remains of Craig, the archive, if you like, he wrote a, num a large number of books, articles, essays, pamphlets, engravings, drawings, notebooks, designs, models, newspaper reports, etc. He offers an incredibly rich mixture of buttons. He left a button box, in fact, of remains that is so large and varied that with careful selection, we can make any number of new archives and play the game of who is Gordon Craig to match our own inclinations and passions. For example, the scholar may easily prove that Craig hated modern technology. Or alternatively, you pick up some more buttons, that he relished the opportunities offered by technology. We may prove that he believed in the autocratic director, the single person as the artist of the theatre. Or we could prove that he believed in the ensemble collaboration of a collective of theatre artists. Likewise, a dancer may select ample evidence to suggest that Craig's true art of the theatre may be found in the dance. A puppet, artist, a puppet artist may likewise find evidence to propose that the, the true art of Craig's theatre may be found within the mask of the marionette. Whereas the actor may suggest that Craig's true art of the theatre may be found in his vision of the selfless performer, the supreme craftsperson of the voice and the body. So by selection, by selection and rearrangement, we can make the extraordinary visions of Gordon Craig be very many things. And so there perhaps can be no final archive or final collection of evidence, as it were, to say, this is Gordon Craig. He spent practically the last 35 years of his life in the form of exile, becoming only widely um, acknowledged during the last 10 or so years of his life. In 1956, when Craig was 84 years old, he was made a companion of honour. And on that occasion, Kenneth Tynan, the great theatre critic, wrote in The Observer, Sunday newspaper, the theatre is not yet ripe for Gordon Craig. When the theatrical millennium arrives, he will be its first harbinger and surest witness. I hope that the talks today and the planned exhibition for the end of the year
will begin to illustrate the extent and the qualities of the revolution which Craig proposed throughout at least half of the last century and to show ways in which his multiple visions continue to provoke, inspire, and excite our theatre today. Thank you very much. Thank you.